So last up in terms of the talks today, and then we'll do the final send-off for, oh. Uh, anybody who has questions for Kay, anybody who's interested, if you want to see the video that she talked about, by all means, go over and meet her over there. Uh, but that aside now, uh, last up in terms of talks today is actually Nick Sayer. He's a friend of Tindy and one of the sellers uh, on the Tindy marketplace. Uh, he's also been a friend of Hackaday and a number of people here uh, for quite some time, selling things through all sorts of different channels. So Nick, why don't you come on up? And a big round of applause for the guy who held out to do the last talk <laughs> for the Hackaday Super Conference. Thank you, Nick. All right, so we're gonna back up quite a bit here. Okay. All right, so um, hi there. I'm going to talk about design. For, DFM, by the way, if you didn't know it, is design for manufacturing. So making a whole pile of them is a little bit different process than just making one. Um, right, so who am I? So I, I my little uh, Tindy uh, store uh, is Geppetto Electronics. Uh, so far, I've manufactured uh, this list of stuff um, I've brought some visual aids to, to show off. You can't really see a lot of the details that I'm talking about now, so I invite you, after I'm done talking, to come over and see what I'm actually talking about in some of the examples that I've brought. <clears throat> um, so DFM is a very lengthy subject, and I was given a very brief amount of time to talk today, so I'm not really going to cover a whole bunch of basics. Uh, Dave Jones really did an excellent job in talking about DFM in the EEV blog video number 127. What I'm really going to concentrate on here is some of the pitfalls, some of the mistakes that I have made and some of the lessons I have learned from making those mistakes. And this last bullet point here is the really risky thing here. I'm going to talk about how much it costs to make a whole pile of widgets and the risk that you do is that you go all the way through the process, you spend uh, many hundreds if not thousands of dollars to make a batch of a few hundred things and you get them back from your assembler and you find out that they're worthless, that they don't work. And some tragic thing has happened that has just flushed that much money down the toilet. Fortunately, that really hasn't happened to me, uh, but it is the, the big risk if you go and assemble a whole bunch of widgets, if they don't work, what are you going to do with them? You're going to plow them into a landfill, and that's not what anybody wants. So there's, there's a relationship here. The more of a thing that you build, the bigger your quantity discounts get from your, from your parts vendors and your, your, your assembler. So the more you make, uh, the more you save. But then, of course, the more you spend. So <clears throat> where these intersections cross is what I've found, at least in my experience, has been around the one to $2,000 mark. You're going to spend that much money <clears throat> to build a batch of a thing. And then how that, how that winds up uh, costing out on the thing that you're building depends on how, how many is in that batch. But <clears throat> if you're not going to spend at least you know, a kilobuck or so, uh, you, you're, 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 the, the assembly cost is just going to be prohibitive. You might as well just buy the boards individually from Oshpark, take them home, and build them yourself. So, uh, these, uh, from the following slides now, the next things that come up at the top are the rules that I'm talking about. And so one of them is minimizing the bomb. So what does that mean and why would you do it? Well, look at what your assembler has. Your assembler is going to do pick and place for you. Now, first off, let me disabu disabuse you of one thing. If you're going to be talking about manufacturing something, uh, you're not going to be doing through hole. You're going to be doing surface mount. So that means that if you're going to start down the road of manufacturing something, the, we're going to talk about prototyping in a minute. That means that you need, really need to prototype stuff with surface mount. So if you haven't figured out how to do surface mount yet, that's step one, is, is to get, get skilled at doing that. It's really not that hard. Um, 
for what it's worth, in my Tindy store, I sell a reflow oven conversion kit to make that, that process a lot easier for you. But, you know, that, that's something that you're going to have to figure out how to do because through hole is not manufacturable anymore at, at any sort of reasonable price point. So, what is your assembler going to do for you? He's going to have a pick and place machine. The pick and place machine is a robot that can pick stuff off of the reels of parts that you supply for building your thing and place them with great precision on a panel of boards. And the parts come from a collection of reels that are loaded onto the machine. And loading those reels onto the machine is a labor point for your assembler. It's something that he has to do. Also, he's got to program the machine, if they're not standardized parts, how to recognize them with its vision system, how to, to, to deal with them. So the number of reels that you have in your bill of materials, which is what BOM means, by the way, if you didn't know that, how, how many of those reels that you have in your parts list uh, is a price point that your assembler has. He's going to charge you a certain amount of money for the certain number of reels that he has to load in his machine. And if it's a really large number, he might charge you a whole bunch because he'll have to do your assembly in two passes. He'll have to load a set of reels on the machine, place a whole bunch of panels, set them aside, then change out all the reels, reload the programming in his, in his pick and place machine, run the boards through again, and then bake them. And he will charge you for that, believe me. <clears throat> so what does that mean? What can you do about that? Well, so you have to start looking at some of the parts of your design. If it calls for a 20K resistor here and a 10K resistor over here, <clears throat> can you get away with putting two 10K resistors in series to try and minimize, to try and not have to supply your assembler with a 20K resistor that you're going to use one of? Um, <clears throat> you know, that's the sort of thing that, that you're going to have to, to, to look at. Um, so where it doesn't matter, pull-up resistors, um, bypass caps, use, use standard decade values as much as you can, simplify your bomb. But of course, it's all for naught if it doesn't work. If, if the change that you make ruins the design, then it's not going to work, which <clears throat> um, actually takes us to this slide, prototype it first. Uh, I talked a little bit about uh, this yesterday during the lightning talk about PCB fab stuff. Um, don't send off a board for your design to, to get fabbed into a printed circuit board without doing, without testing it, you know, without you, leveraging your CAD software to do the rat's nest and the design rules check. If you send a board off to get fabbed and you get back and you find that one of your ground planes has been islanded, you're going to be very unhappy about that. You've made art, not printed circuit boards. So prototype it first. That goes back to, to this thing. If it's, it's all for naught, if the design doesn't work, you should find that out before you order a thousand of them. So, next, panelizing. When you when you make one in your garage, you're gonna you're gonna buy a board from Oshpark. It's gonna come, and you're gonna use solder paste and place all the components on it, reflow it, and you're done. Great. But your assembler is not gonna work one at a time unless the board's really huge. In which case, now you're gonna be talking that that board's gonna be very expensive to manufacture. You're gonna be doing something like this. This is a panel. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it very well, but there are 12 individual boards on here. And that way, uh, your assembler, remember, think of his process. He picks a board up. He puts it on the table. He uses a template to squeegee the solder paste onto it. He puts it down, and then the robot picks all, puts all the parts on it. That's the part that he uh, can do very cheaply, because the more often the robot is working, then the less it's going to cost you because he can get done faster and time is money. So you want to make sure your panels have as many boards in them as you can possibly fit, but don't make them so big that your assembler now can't fit them on the robot. The robot has a certain size work table, the pick and place machine, so you, if you make a panel that's too big, your assembler is going to get sore at you. Uh, he's probably going to have to break the panel in half and then all of a sudden the cost formulas change and stuff. Uh, <clears throat> other things, you'll notice that these are individual boards, but they're in a panel, and the panel connects all the boards together to hold them stable in a matrix. Uh, but when you're done with the pick and place stuff, you get back these panels. Now you've got to chop the, the individual boards out because you don't want to. You can't use 30 of them at a time. You have to separate them. So that's uh, there's two processes for that: tab routing and v grooving. 
they make weak points where you can split the boards apart. This was the first time I panelized a board and I made a terrible mistake. I, my uh, tabs here, for, to make it uh, a long story short, these tabs are too strong. I didn't make them weak enough so that they could break easily, so I have to dremel all these boards apart. So that, that's something to learn from. If you can get away with it, if, you're, if, you're fab, if your board fab will do it, V-grooming is much better because when you break the boards apart, they have a nice crisp edge on them. There's no tab chaff to deal with. When they're going inside an enclosure, usually that doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, if they'll, if they'll do it for you and they don't charge extra for it, I don't know why you wouldn't uh, take advantage of that. Um, so I have examples of uh, um, other things. Oh, so here's another one. Um, if you're going to do tab routing, um, make sure that if you have uh, parts that overhang the edge of the board, don't put a tab under them. <laughs> this was a big sore spot for the USB micro ISP. Uh, so you can, have, you can come up and see the example of where that went wrong. Fortunately, in this case, the assembler was able to work around it. Otherwise, he probably would have had to have broken all those tabs off, and that would have added to his uh, cost, which I'm sure he would have transferred. <clears throat> um, now, here's, a, here's another one, um, another lesson I learned. I learned this one. I'm going to be a little bit gentle here, because this actually was not my lesson. It was SparkFun's. Um, whenever you have a thing that has a microcontroller in it, be sure to put somewhere on there an, a footprint for in-system programming. DigiKey will pre-program your chips for you. If you pay them a little extra, they'll pre-program them for you. And that's fine. Uh, that saves you a step. But keep in mind that one thing that's kind of nice is that if, you're, if you have in-circuit programming as a post-assembly step, that does kind of test out part of your system, right? If, if you can't program the controller, then you know that that board needs to be reworked. So that's, that is kind of a nice thing, is to be able to program them after you build them. You know that they that they survive the, the process. Um, so that's, that's a helpful thing in and of itself. But then also, you know, you're going to have um, uh, firmware that's, that's more agile. You're going to find bugs in your firmware, and you're going to want to fix them. Uh, when I made the crazy clock, that's these boards here, uh, one of the things that I, uh, I, I didn't understand fully at the time was uh, how loading capacitance on crystals work. So these wound up being 130 parts per million too, too fast. So when this was brought to my attention, I suddenly had to scramble to come up with a way to fix this because I had 300 of these, and if they were no good, that was that landfill moment that I talked about earlier. Fortunately, I was able to figure out a workaround in firmware that slowed the action of this thing down by that same 130 parts per million, and I could program the trim factors in, in EEPROM and all sorts of details that, that uh, make a nice story, but. But the, the lesson here is that if I didn't put an ISP header on that board, that really would have meant that they went in the landfill because nobody wants a clock that's 130 parts per million fast that gains 10 seconds a day. That's ridiculous. So put an ISP header on there. Even if you don't think you're going to use it, that can save you from the landfill moment, which is the big, again, that's the thing you want to avoid at all costs. So that's really about all I had prepared so far. Uh, my vendors that I really like, uh, I've given shout outs here. MG Circuit, you may not have heard of. Uh, they are the people that, uh, that I went to to get these boards made. Uh, the Crazy Clock, I could only get them made with one millimeter thickness, which Osh, Osh Park unfortunately wouldn't do. Uh, they don't have multiple thicknesses yet. So uh, they wound up doing a really good job, though. I'm very happy with them. Um, some of, some of the fabs, like dirty PCBs, they have idiosyncrasies. This is another thing to watch out for, the idiosyncrasies of your board fab. So one of the things I learned how to do in making enclosures, <clears throat> uh, you get the extruded aluminum enclosures. This is, again, I give, give credit to Dave Jones for this. You can get printed circuit boards fabbed to make the front panels of them. Uh, now, that's a, a great technique. One of the things that happens if you go to dirty PCBs, though, is they'll put a code number on the front of your board, and they do that for internal tracking purposes. Um, Oshpark doesn't do that, but Dirty does. <clears throat> Which, you know, on a board that's going inside an enclosure, I don't really care about, but when they put the, the number right on the front panel of your, uh, of your front panel of your, of your enclosure, uh, that's not so nice. So now I've got a, a, a pile of those that have a code number on the front that actually shows. If I'd have known that, if I'd have remembered that at the time, I would have flipped the Gerbers around so their code number would have been on the inside of the front panel, and I wouldn't have cared. <clears throat> so 
try and, you know, it's an awful lot of stuff to juggle, but try and keep all of those things in mind uh, when, you're, when you're working on uh, uh, how, to, how to design your, your product for, for manufacturing. Um, that is about it, so I guess questions will be over there. And you can take a look at some of the uh, examples that I brought to, uh, to see in actual hardware the, the lessons that, uh, that I've learned from them. And big thanks to Nick for holding out and actually being the last speaker today. I understand that trying to cover DFM in a very short period of time is a pretty amazing and difficult thing to do. So thank you. <laughs> That's right. If, if you only paid attention to what he just said right there, then you should run straight into production. Um, so Nick will be over there if you have any questions, that sort of thing.